Well, hey, everybody. I hope you're as happy to be here today as I am. This is really exciting. Um, you know, the other day, I'm watching television, right? And this guy comes on, and he's talking about the age of discovery. And this is the period between the 15th and the 18th century when we had transatlantic vessels that could make voyages from the old world to the new world. So naturally, this guy thought, well, every time we go from the old world to the new world, we find new stuff. And this new stuff has got to be brand new discoveries to all of humankind. OK, well, the Eurocentric nature of that notion notwithstanding, you've got to remember, the millions of indigenous people in the new world already already knew that stuff was there. They didn't need Europeans to come tell them that it was new. OK? Um, that doesn't really, to me, constitute what I consider to be an age of discovery. But there is an age of discovery, and it's now. And in fact, in the field of biology, we have discovered more in the last 10 years than probably since the dawn of humankind. Okay? And my message to any students who may be out there streaming this right now, or all the students in the room, and especially my students in this audience, <laughs> do not be a bystander to this age of discovery. Be a participant. Because there are lots of new places out there in the world that still need to be explored, OK? It could be some remote rainforest in Southeast Asia, or the top of some arid mountain in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Heck, you might find yourself in total darkness, half a mile underground, exploring a limestone cave in Burma. But if you're really lucky, you're going to end up on some tropical island in the South Pacific, right? <laughs> Looking for all these new species. And what we're finding out is the more we go out there, and the more that we look, we're realizing that there are more species on this planet than we had ever imagined. And now, we're not only exploring the remote corners of the Earth, we're exploring the remote corners of the genome, the DNA, the very fabric of life that binds every single living organism on this planet to every other single living organism on this planet. And you know what? We're also finding out our health and our survival is more dependent on the integrity of that fabric and the threads of species that compose that fabric than we had ever imagined. And that's what we got to protect. And this is where my lab comes in. My students and myself, we work in Southeast Asia. Imagine an area that composes only 4% of the world's total land mass, but yet within that 4%, is 25% of the species on this planet. Okay? That is an amazing metric. Okay? If you do a little bit of math in your head there. But what's really difficult to understand, to wrap your head around, is that we're losing dozens of those species every day because of catastrophic rainforest deforestation. Okay? And in so doing, we're creating these really toxic habitats that is affecting the health of humanity all around us. And so what my students, and myself are we what we call ourselves biological systematists and biogeographers. What that means is we figure out what is a new species of life on the planet, who it's related to, and why it's found where it is. Okay? Now, the cool thing about this is that we get to go to all those remote places, places where no one in the world has ever been, and often places where no one in the world really wants to go, <laughs> unfortunately. But sometimes it can be really exciting. You know, you hop on a boat in the Gulf of Thailand, zip out to some little tiny island that's never been explored, and you find this brand new species of psychedelic gecko that's never been seen before, right? And you're the one who gets to describe it. You get to call it the psychedelic gecko, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, unfortunately, it's a, Phil works a little bit more inglorious than that, usually. Uh, for example, this is a trip that we did to Cambodia, up the Cardamom Mountains, and this is our camp. Um, we ran out of fresh food, so we had to boil rotten meat in oil to kill the bacteria before we could eat it. Uh, one of our porters died, and we were constantly dodging landmines throughout the whole trip. And then other places we go, we're, we're always coming in contact with dangerous animals that may be, you know, a 15-foot cobra, that's a king cobra that's so big that when it hoods up, you know, it's looking at you at eye level like this, right? <laughs> And it's usually pretty pissed off because you just invaded his territory, right? Well, this is sort of the nature, this is sort of the nature of field work. Now, recently, we were commissioned by an NGO, a non-governmental organization, in Burma, also called Myanmar, 
Fauna and Flora International, and they wanted us to come survey karst, or these limestone habitats, that were being ground down to the ground by industrial companies that were extracting the minerals for cement. And they specifically wanted us to survey for geckos. In particular, they wanted us to visit these places here, the upper elevations of the Sham Plateau and the lower elevations of the Salween Basin. Now, first of all, working in Myanmar, for me, was just one of the most remarkable experiences ever. The, the landscapes here are so beautiful, these karst towers and everything. And they even put pagodas on the tops of these things. Okay, it's absolutely incredible. And so, again, for me, working in a place like this, it was like a kid you know, chasing lizards in Disneyland. It was unbelievably cool. And then the people that we came across are just remarkably hospitable and kind, and the ethnic diversity was just like off the charts. We travel like you know, 20, 25 kilometers across the Shan Plateau and come across four or five different ethnic groups of so their own dialects, their own languages, and they couldn't even communicate with one another. And very few of them could even speak the national language of Burmese. Okay? It was just, just a phenomenal place. However, um, we soon found out that working in Myanmar had obstacles also, nonetheless of which was food. Um, on this meal here, we had gutted and skinned rats, which were boiled in oil. Okay, now not to worry, we had a healthy side opening, a side serving of boiled crickets along with it. That, that made it go well. Um, some of the places that we're working, they are currently literally blowing up. Okay, these orange tubes you see on the ground are dynamite that are shoving down the holes, and they're blowing up the mountainside that we're currently working on. Okay. And then, if any of you are aware of what's going on in Myanmar, there's, lot, there's lots of conflict zones. There's lots of rebel militias fighting the government, rebel militias fighting other rebel militias, rebel militias and the government fighting another rebel, rebel militia. Very confusing. I could never really get it figured out. But it was one of those things that you always had to deal with. But if you can get through all that, okay, if you can get through all that, Myanmar is a wonderful place to be, okay? <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, folks, you're working in these beautiful landscapes, these majestic karst tower formations, just incredible. So, what is a karst tower formation? Karst, or limestone, basically what it is it? It's a fossilized coral reef, okay, that's been pushed up above the surface of the ground and weathered, okay? It cracks, it erodes, it forms caves, and all these little nooks and crannies, all these little nooks and crannies, they provide microhabitats for different species to get in there and make their own little niche and evolve and adapt to them. So you consider these karst areas as, as arcs of biodiversity that provide the substrate for the evolution of new species. And some of these are, these, these arcs of biodiversity are surrounded by water, and the only way we can get to them is, is by boat. Some of them are caves that are so long, no one's ever been to the, to the end of them, and often there's rivers flowing through them as well. Uh, yet others are, well, the sad thing is, some of the entrance, these cave entrances, you have to climb two or three hundred meters up on these little rickety ladders just to get to the entrance. And then others are maybe 700, 800 meters above the ground. You have to scale these mountains just to get to the top to collect up there. Um, the ones that I like most are the ones that are protected by monasteries, because in these monasteries, there's usually a monk. And the monks have these really cool ideas about ecosystems and ecology, all right? Rather than having dominion and mastery over everything, they're like, nah, nah, we are all fully integrated into the ecosystem, okay? So by protecting the ecosystem, by default, we are protecting ourselves. All right, so our daily routine when we're in the, we're in the field of Myanmar is we look for a place that looks like it might be good for geckos, and we go check it out during the day. Because we want to walk around during the day, find a place to go at night, because the collecting we do is all at night, but these animals are nocturnal, meaning they only come out at night. And you don't want to be wandering around where there's landmines and all that sort of stuff in the middle of the night. And it's just, it's a recipe for a huge disaster. So once we do that, then we go back out at night. Now, a little bit of a sidebar here. I told you that some of these places we work were in conflict zones. And sometimes they hire a military force to protect us. And these guys right here, they were protecting our whole group at the time. But the guy sitting next to me, he was assigned to me specifically. This guy was my homie. I mean, this guy was on my six everywhere I went. I couldn't shake him if I tried. And in another group we worked with, the guy who was assigned to me was absolutely blown away that I could run up to the side of a limestone hill, grab a gecko off it, stick it in a bag. This was like outside his window of reality. This stuff doesn't happen, right? 
And he became so excited about doing that, he started grabbing geckos and throwing them in the bag. <laughs> All right, you know? But then it kind of went crazy. That wasn't enough for him. He took my bag of geckos and ran off into the night. Okay? But guess what? He gave me his gun, all right? So I'm like, now I'm totally confused, right? Because I have no idea who the enemy was. Okay? I didn't know who to shoot, okay? And that's a problem in a conflict zone, all right? Well, long story short, end of the night, I got my geckos back, he got his gun back, nobody got shot, okay? Everything worked out. I consider that a win-win for everybody. All right, so after we catch all these, these cool geckos, we bring them back to the lab, myself and my students, we examine their anatomy and their color pattern very, very carefully, and we take little snippets of tissue samples and create these beautifully colored evolutionary trees that you see here. And what's neat about it is that it's these trees that tell us if we have new species or not. Because if we have a new species, it is the only one that's going to occur on that branch of the evolutionary tree. That is, no other form of life on this planet will occupy that branch with that species. And that's how we know that we got something new. And what's really coming out of this that really surprised us is that the biodiversity in these karst systems is crazy. And it's approaching that of the adjacent rainforest, OK? But what's more, even more exciting about that, it is what is referred to as site-specific endemism. That means that one species, that unique species that occupied that branch on that tree, it's only found in one place in the world, and that's that karst tower. And you know what? Those karst towers may be smaller than this entire building that we're in right now. And just let me give you a quick example here. Just look at the blue dots and the green dots in the solving basin here. Those are places that we've already been collecting, and we got about 35 new species out of there. All the orange dots, that's 44 localities we haven't even been to yet. So the biodiversity and site-specific endemism of the Solomon Basin is going to skyrocket in the next few years. Once I get some of you wonderful high school students who are going to come to La Sierra University, join my lab, we'll go make ourselves famous, right? We only do that? OK, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so let's do the fun stuff now. Let me show you how beautiful some of these geckos are. This is a species we found at the very base of the Sean Plateau at a lowland site. Up way up high in the mountains of the Sean Plateau in a limestone hill, we found this species. We found this species in complete darkness in a cave in the Sean Plateau. And then down in the Solween Basin in a lowland area, we find this magenta gecko right here. Yeah, it's like, really? <laughs> okay. And then this guy we found in an isolated mountain in the Irrawaddy Basin, and this flaming orange species, yeah, this flaming orange species we found in the crest of the mountains of the Champ Plateau. So what? Really, who cares, <laughs> right? I mean, really, there's a gecko on a rock for certain people. Why should this little girl, why should this little girl named Poe, who lives in Chichultrum Village, at the base of the Cardamom Mountains in Cambodia, why should she care that we found several new species of amphibians and reptiles in the rainforest that surround her village? Well, because now, because of that, we can put pressure on the Cambodian government to protect that section of rainforest. That rainforest is what these villagers depend on for their health and survival. And as soon as we start degrading that rainforest by pulling species out of it, the health of these people is going to suffer. And if we degrade that rainforest enough that it, that ecosystem completely collapses, people die. And if you get nothing out of this talk today, take this home with you. When ecosystems collapse, people die, right? That is not hyperbole. We've seen that from time on in since the dawn of humanity. It's just happening now on a bigger global scale. And the most important issue here is that this is not a medical problem. This is an ecological problem. Those people get sick. We can, we can fix them with medicine. But what's going to happen when we put those fixed people back into an unhealthy ecosystem? They're going to get sick again, right? This is an ecological problem, not a medical one. And this point never became so poignantly clear to me. Until one time, I was at the very tip of the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. And I'm, I'm doing some field work there with my son, Jesse. And we're photographing this, this polluted river, more specifically this pile of, of garbage that's decomposing in the sun there. 
And you know, you, know, you take your picture and you look at the LCD and your screen is what's there. When I looked on that LCD, I could see down at the very bottom, there's a little girl sitting there. And so instantly, daddy mode kicks in, right? And I jump down off the bridge and I run down there to see what this little girl is doing. And she was dipping a plastic cup into the water so she could get a drink. All right? Now, we can cure all the waterborne diseases she's going to get from drinking this river, right? But what's the obvious problem here, folks? She's going to get thirsty tomorrow, right? So it's a no-brainer. Fix the river, fix the evil system, save the little girl. Now, does this concept of ecosystem health and human health apply only to little girls in Southeast Asia? Not at all. This little girl here, her name is Sunny. She lives 20 miles down the road from here, where I'm speaking here in Riverside, California. And she likes to go hiking with her dog, Lola. And coincidentally, they too like chasing lizards. And she said to me the other day, Grandpa, can I chase lizards when I'm a grown-up? And I said, baby, I just don't know. I couldn't give her an honest answer, because I don't know what the ecosystems are going to be like when she's a grown-up. And that's the point here, folks. The world is on a knife edge right now. We're at a tipping point. And y'all better start paying attention to that, OK? Because of this age of discovery right here, right now, this may be our last chance to save it. So all you students out there, I don't care if you're working in the hottest, most arid place on the planet, or you're stuck in some dank, dreary, cold rainforest on the top of some mountain in Malaysia. My message is, go out there, make your tracks, that other people can follow, and do not be a bystander in this age of discovery. Be a participant. Thank you.